Thank you, everyone, for tuning in another week of uh, Telehealth Failures and Secrets to Success uh, video podcast. So I'm Milton Chen, the CEO of VC, the telehealth company behind about 1,200 plus customers, plus this American dog, our 4,000 plus physician network. So this week, um, we have a special guest, Dr. Chris O'Brien, an advanced practice pharmacist and the founder of Cash Bay Telepsychiatry Practice, who is now practicing 100% by telehealth. So I'm really excited to hear his insight on how he can do 100%. And he's also a longtime martial art practitioner and will be testing with his 11-year-old son for their black belts at the end of this year. So I'm pretty excited to hear about that. So Chris's dream is to be able to um, work from anywhere in the world as though he's living in California. So it's great to have you here today. Well, thank you, Dr. Chen, for having me. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a pleasure. Yeah, um, yeah, so it's been a dream of mine. You know, I remember um, when I was back at Regional Center, we used to do team assessments and our, our team psychiatrists mm. actually went to Armenia. Mm. Yeah, and was okay. able to, to participate in team. This is long before, you know, telehealth really kind of picked up. And it was cool. And, you know, he had this fantasy of, wow, I could live in Armenia and still see my patients <laughs> in California. Yeah, yeah, I think given the network... It just seems that there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to do that, right? So I think what's nice about the psychiatry is there's, there's no devices in there. It really is through this visual communications. So. I mean, there is physical assessment. We have to monitor for side effects and okay. so forth. But yeah. Clearly, a, you know, another clinician can can do that, you mm -hmm. know. But yeah, it lends right. itself nicely. It's, it's almost, you feel kind of guilty with these fantasies of living elsewhere <laughs> in the U.S. South, so... So, so we get to hopefully explore and share with the audience how we can make your fantasy of this li living anywhere, working anywhere come true. I guess before we um, dive into maybe the like the 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 media side, I'm just curious about either like can you share a little bit maybe your interest in like martial arts? You know, can you like kick through five boards or can you like beat up people? No, no, I wish. No, martial arts is a big part of my my upbringing. You know, um, okay. I started in, you know, some Japanese arts, some Chinese arts, well, like Wing Chun. And then it kind of broke off for a while when I went in the military and went off to school. But then I have mm -hmm. children. So, you know, I thought it was kind of cool because to me, a black belt is somewhat like a college degree. You know, mm -hmm. it's something that you all of us have, you know, mm -hmm. no one can take away from you. And it kind of is transformative. It's not just about fighting. So, mm -hmm. so now I have both my children in, and my son has been since he was like four years old, mm -hmm. <laughs> a little little Buddhist monk. <laughs> yes. uh, awesome. And, and I thought it'd be really cool if you know I would get my second black belt, but this time in the style that he's training. And then also, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has really been in the forefront, and and having the courage to kind of start over because when you change more mm -hmm. shorts, you're also humbling yourself so it's mm -hmm. there's a lot of life lessons in that <laughs> god i got but then i have another uh, burning question uh, for you is uh, so what is advanced practice pharmacist and how does it like relate to the practice of telepsychiatry yeah you know i remember when i first got my credentials and everything people at the airport because i commute back and forth between los angeles and, and northern california uh -huh. and they said what do you do you know yeah. and for the longest time i would just say i'm a psychopharmacologist I didn't mm. quite know what else to say. If I said I was a, a psychiatric pharmacist, they would think yeah. I'm instantly in industry or I'm involved in, yeah. you know, in pharma. So it was hard. So um, I, I think the best way to explain it is is it's a PharmD, a doctor of pharmacy, um, mm -hmm. who's had additional training and can now be more part of the treatment and evaluation team. Mm. Got it, got it, got it. So then does that mean, so for example, you can, part of your roles, can, you can even help other psychiatrists, help them, give them advice on things like medication and so on. Like how does that differ from maybe just like a normal, maybe pharmacist in there? Is that just your special yeah. kind of So, so <laughs> um, traditionally my career started off as a consultant to, to treatment okay. teams and psychiatrists. And um, over time, especially when I was at CHLA, eventually, you know, it's kind of like you end up having your own patient load, <laughs> you know, over time okay. because there's okay. overload, you know. So mm -hmm. I functioned as a consultant on difficult cases and then also 
I ended up having my own patient panel over time. So it, okay. you know, after the physicians become comfortable with you, they know who you are. And, you know, of course, you have additional training. Got it, got it. Okay, that, uh, thanks for explaining that. And it's uh, pretty neat to hear how the sort of the pharmacist role are expanding and, uh, and how they're becoming these sort of physician extenders for medication management. I think that's a big yeah. area. I guess um, as before we get started, I'll just maybe maybe bounce side, you know, checking on the like the, what is some of the latest news. You know, for example, this week uh, there's a Forbes article. I think that's going around a lot of people citing mm. uh, by the digital health strategist John. No so he wrote about is telemedicine dead on before it arrives, which I thought oh, was really God. provocative. So his basic premise was to say, look, all the chat box is coming around, like you know, Google's been working on a bunch of things, you know, from Google, Amazon, they have these sort of chat bots, now they can sort of sort of communicate with the specific things like sort of mental health, like symptom checker, all these things. Like I was just curious, like, you know, what's your like like what's your like perspective on like what uh you know the, the yeah the I, I'm looking at what google is actually i have a friend who actually is an ai you know not with google but in our company so he always keeps everything so hush hush or secret until a couple yeah. of glasses of wine he starts to open up to me and tell me about yeah. three <laughs> <laughs> and, and so i you know i'm nowhere near his level he, he's a phd like yourself and so he's in a whole other category and then i mm. i listened to some of you know, uh, on YouTube, I listened to a presentation uh, about Google's AI. The first presentation mm -hmm. was about the chatbots that like you were describing. Mm -hmm. And the second one was a presentation by two physicians that are mm -hmm. team leaders at Google. And they're they're working on this. And, you know, it really came down to precision and specificity and and, and whether you can do that with artificial intelligence. They're telling, talking something like 10,000 repetitions, you know, for, mm -hmm. yeah. for these algorithms to therefore evolve and and learn, which is the definition of yeah. intelligence. I, I guess my concern is, you know, healthcare changes so rapidly, and you just kind of wonder mm -hmm. how to update, you know, this information because it's going to be pulling yeah. from some sort of database. I don't think it's like yeah. a secret database, but it's some kind of database, and it's going to pull that information and to be to be intelligent. So I don't, I think it has a role. You know, there's 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 several medical disciplines mm -hmm. or specialties mm -hmm. that there's not enough providers and yeah. so it could be a tool for those providers. So I can see that taking place and actually that is occurring. So, yeah, that makes sense. I think my vision is always, I thought like the AI chatbot and telemedicine, in fact, it goes are almost like two sides of the same coin. So the, the role of this AI chatbot is to you know, minimize the, so it's a productivity enhancer for the providers in there. They could do some of the thing more repetitive maybe do some assessment and everything, then in the end, really it's a human beings in there to loop, to yeah. help try the best clinical outcome. Yeah. You know, there's even a doctor in Star Trek and they had all the equipment and computer. So. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a great point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's my evidence that it's all gonna work out. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone will be happy. Yeah. I guess, um, again, so by the way, so Chris, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on that. And, <clears throat> I know you got a great presentation for us today. So on how do you start your own cash-based telehealth practice? And I would love to maybe like turn the floor over to you and have you share your uh, experience with us. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm proud to share this. Uh, it, it takes a lot to start a practice and trying to obtain information, it was, it was a challenge. It was very time consuming. So let me do what we practice. And then I can, yep, I have access. Okay. Okay. Um, so kind of jumping right into it. Okay. So what we're going to cover, um, you know, how pharmacists collaborate with physicians, uh, what is an advanced practice pharmacist. And I'll, I'll try to go quickly over that because I mean, that may not be interesting to a lot of people, but I think the pros and cons of cash-based telepsychiatry will be. Um, important consider considerations if you're switching over from, you know, a, a third um, third party payer system over into a cash based practice and practical tips on getting started. And then I'll answer any questions that you folks may have. OK, so I think the first thing is also, you know, have a goal. And so the goal of, I think, telehealth in general 
has been increased access to quality patient care. And that's also the reason for advanced practice pharmacists evolving into physician extenders, is to um, increase access to quality patient care. And I'm sure all of you already know the definition of telehealth, but it's kind of hard to jump into a presentation if you don't define what it is. So telehealth is basically um, intervention of telecommunication to communicate with um, a patient. And telepsychiatry, of course, would be a, a subset of that. So again, I'm trying to move quickly through this part because you guys already know it. Okay, so what is an advanced practice pharmacist? It's basically a new category, but the thing is there's always been clinical pharmacists and there's always been pharmacists on parts of, of treatment teams. Um, California kind of spearheaded in the United States the ability to kind of formalize it and have an additional license. Um, so in other countries that use um, you know, advanced practice pharmacists as well, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and then 38 other states um, permit collaborative drug therapy management between pharmacists and physicians. Okay, and then um, what else is special about it? Well, we have between two to four years of additional training, clinical supervision and testing. Um, we're primarily physician extenders and we're focused in specialized areas of pharmacotherapy. Okay, and it's not just psychiatric pharmacy, but there are several and there's some other organizations as well, but the Board of Pharmacy Specialties is the most recognized. Um, in, in our industry. And so we have AMCARE, critical care, nuclear, nutrition, oncology, pediatric, generalized pharmacotherapy, and lastly, my specialty, which is psychiatric pharmacy. Um, for qualifications, you know, um, so there's a licensing side and there's a board certification side. So um, for the licensing side, I mean, they're, they're rigorous about, you know, compliance. So we have to either have board specialty in a relevant area, complete a postgraduate residency, um, or a third option is 1,500 hours of clinical experience under a collaborative practice agreement within 10 years. But that's separate from what's needed for board certification. So for example, myself, I had four years of additional supervision um, before I could sit down for my examination. Okay, enough of that. Oh, one more thing. Uh, so what, what can an advanced practice pharmacist actually do? They can perform patient assessments, order, interpret all drug therapy related tests. We can refer um, patients to other healthcare providers, which is something I commonly do. And of course, drug therapy management, you know, initiating, adjusting based on, you know, treatment outcomes. And it's performed in a protocol and in collaboration with a trained prescriber. So one difference, one, one difference between nurse practitioners, um, PAs and and pharmacists, sorry, is that it's really not a supervising physician, it's a collaborating physician. So we kind of maintain our own insurance and, and um, we're responsible for our, our actions, maybe a little bit more. Not that they're not, but I'll try to get down here. So here's what a collaborative agreement looks like. This is the one I have with um, Dr. Smith. He's, he's, my, he's my collaborating psychiatrist. And so basically we define our scope of practice, what we're gonna do. And either you can have a collaborative agreement or you can have like um, an order to, to provide drug therapy management for a patient on a patient by patient basis, or you can have a protocol. So like Dr. Smith and I, you know, we see lots of patients. So we just have a protocol between us. Um, so basically, you know, I perform all these things, but if something's not going well with the patient, then I'll refer back, back to Dr. Smith. Okay, this is something that's gonna be interesting to everyone, I hope. Uh, the pros and cons of cash-based telepsychiatry. And who's better <laughs> as a metaphor than Clint Eastwood? So. Okay, the good side of things. And it's kind of an interesting question too because cash-based telepsychiatry. So we're, we're looking at from both a, a patient perspective, um, a clinician perspective, but then also these are two different things as well where you have you know, cash-based and you have telepsychiatry. So these are four different things <clears throat> to kind of think about. You know, because we're not just asking the question, what's the benefits of telehealth? We're actually asking the benefits um, of telehealth as, that someone's paying for out of pocket. So the good, so patients, there's more availability, so patients feel better cared for. 
you know, one of the things when I first started doing this, it was always this kind of fear that you wouldn't be able to have a very good therapeutic relationship. And it's actually the opposite. People are much more comfortable in their own homes. They, they like the idea of not commuting someplace. I mean, it's really been a, a big plus. So in reality, it's actually an enhanced therapeutic relationship. Um, much smaller patient panel, which can translate into better care. There's no waiting rooms for the patient. It's easy to, collaboration on diff and to collaborate on difficult cases. You know, the population I serve, a lot of times there's a behavior analyst involved, um, there's other doctors involved, um, staff, and you can collaborate with everyone using this technology, which is good for the patient. It's great for families when there's more than one child. Um, convenience and access to care offset out-of-pocket costs. So um, what I charge, I mean, essentially, it's, it's a, the price of an expensive gym membership, right? And a lot of people, you know, first they're like, oh, you don't accept insurance, but then they see what is being offered and how they're gonna be cared for, and they don't mind at that point, you know? And for the clinician side, uh-oh, what happened? Uh, for the clinician side, um, overall, my well-being is enhanced. You know, it's amazing to have the flexibility to not have to drive someplace, to not have to maintain office staff, and all the costs that go with that. Um, and, <laughs> you know, many times I've, you know, dealt with um, patients who had been, you know, discharged from a 72-hour hold or had been incarcerated and they come off not on their medications and unstable and I've been attacked several times. So <laughs> for me, it's kind of nice to be able to focus on my interview, focus on treatment planning without worrying about trying to defend against maybe someone who who's a little bit hostile at the moment. So I kind of like that. Um, I'm responsible only to the patient. You know, um, when there's a third party payer, sometimes there can be issues with um, not agreeing with, you know, your diagnosis and then reimbursement and so forth. When you're responsible to the patient, the proof is in the pudding. If the patient's quality of life is better, um, if they're getting on with their life, you know, because you're helping them, then they'll continue to see you, you know, so that's nice. I get to wear shorts. Not today, out of respect for Milton, but I can wear shorts and a tie if I want, which is kind of cool. Okay, the bad. And not really that bad. So for a patient, they do want to be able to use your insurance. Um, I think a general attitude towards healthcare is people don't think they should pay for it. <laughs> That's kind of a general kind of like um, gestalt mentality about healthcare. So some patients may not like the fact they can't use their insurance and they have to pay for it. Um, you have to manage first experience as well. So a lot of times you expect the patient to be able to use VC, for example, and they don't have the camera set up correctly or they can't hear you, you can't hear them. And that can lead to frustrations. And as we all know, kind of that first experience is really important. So just like when you when you greet a patient the first time, it's the first step towards developing a therapeutic relationship. Now you have another layer you kind of have to manage to make sure you can still have that. You know, you want that first experience to be good with the patient. That shows you're trying to develop rapport with them. Um, there's a delay in receiving Schedule II medications. So for example, management of ADHD. Um, oftentimes you schedule two stimulants, and so you have to mail that out. Um, clinicians, um, you know, what's a little bit bad? So if you're 100% telehealth-based, <clears throat> you kind of have to plan for professional and social encounters. So if you're working in a practice and you have staff and so forth, there's natural social encounters. And, and it's important, right, for your well-being. So if you're, you know, a solo practitioner and you're working from home or even off of someplace, and you have to kind of maybe plan a little bit more for your for your own mental health. Um, less patients can use your services. So generally, kind of that Freudian neurotic kind of range, you know, the type of patients that are not that ill are the ones that kind of pay. And it's kind of like that. So less patients can use your services because generally they're going to be healthier and employed, right? Although there are um, institutions that will also find your services valuable enough that they'll pay out of their budget. Um, and I kind of mentioned Milton before, you know, there is a reliance on others for physical assessment, blood pressure monitoring, and believe me, sometimes when you ask a family to monitor their child's blood pressure, you can get some really interesting readings. So, you know, it's something to really, you have to plan for. Any ugly, I mean, that's a very strong term, but, um, so the only negative, big negative, I think for 
for telehealth in general, for outpatient psychiatry, is when the patients try to use you for emergency situations instead of using emergency services like 911 and, and or or um, certain hotlines for for suicidal thinking, you know, using you for that, which can be a mistake, and that can delay care in emergency. Um, for the clinician, I think you know sometimes I feel some risk with HIPAA violations because someone's in their house and other people are walking around, and here you are talking with the patient. You just kind of wonder, so you kind of have to manage that as well. Um, and a little bit a little bit funny, but not too funny, is I do have two children, and you know they come home from school at three thirty, and, and my <laughs> my heart always starts to beat because I know when they come through they're going to be loud they're going to be arguing and they might come into my office which which is not great so that has to be managed and if you promise 24 hour availability so one of the things we talked about before doing this presentation was not to use the term concierge I guess that's kind of falling out a little bit but in general if you're a patient's paying you they're going to expect better service so you have to keep that promise okay. So important considerations of switching over, you have to know your why. I mean, why do you want to do it? You know, for me, it was more an issue of, you know, less patience, you know, to manage and manage them better. So that was important to me. And also, again, the flexibility of being elsewhere than your patient is and still be able to care for them. Um, you know, some of your patients will need. So if you already have an existing practice and you're change, moving over to cash based only, some of your patients will need to be referred out to an air clinician. And if if they're if you've been caring for them for a long time, that can be difficult, depending on their psychiatric history. So you have to plan for that. Um, you have to become comfortable selling your services. You know, um, it's, it's something where you feel kind of icky about it, you know, because you don't want to feel like you're selling widgets, you're selling healthcare. And you have to get over that hump a little bit, that really you're providing a message to people saying, hey, I'm here, but you're not, you're not providing a hard sell. And and sometimes that can be hard for people. It was hard for me to kind of do that, right? And you have to have referral sources. Um, you have to have sufficient savings as you work on obtaining new patients because uh, you have to be able to pay your bills and loans and whatnot. Um, you, and most people should really discuss this with their insurance carrier as well to make sure that they cover uh, telehealth. Um, and what's kind of cool when you're on a team or you're like, a, you know, in a in a clinic someplace, usually there's there's cross auditing of records, of patient records. So I think that's still important, and you kind of have to build it in to somehow you can get feedback on your caseload, you know, because otherwise we can all kind of we all kind of need to be kind of readjusted sometimes in in how we assess and treat. Okay, so practical tips on getting started. Um, you have to have a business and a marketing plan. It sounds so cliche, but you'd be surprised how many people just set off and don't have these. I mean, it's really important. And, and actually, as you write these documents, it's almost like an exercise in asking the why again and really kind of um, whatever mental image you're going to have, what that practice is going to look like, it's going to become much more clear as you're, as you're writing these documents. And this was something I think was really helpful is use marketers with health industry experience. You know, if you, you know, because you're, you're going to do social media marketing for sure. Um, you have to have an online presence. And, you know, general marketing. So, so there's a lot that goes into this and having someone with health industry experience can be great. You know, it does, it can become expensive. So again, you have to really kind of look at what your, what your goal is and you try to predict, I spend $5 on marketing, but I make, you know, $20, you know, in, in, in service fees. So you have to kind of figure out what that is and what your ratio is going to be. Um, you have to know how to obtain your patients and have amazing customer service. So it becomes kind of different. So I think for a lot of clinicians, it's like there's more patient need than than providers. So supply demand. So sometimes that's why I think some people, um, how can I say this? So we expect to get patients. So sometimes we might not provide the best customer service, but you have to change that attitude because now you're searching for the patient and their expectations are higher. So they call, you answer, or you have a service that's gonna do that for you. Um, if someone goes on your website, there should be an immediate way for them to reach you. You know, So web design becomes very much more important. You have to use proven technology platforms and I research this a lot. Um, you know, VC was probably I think the second or third company I looked at, but it, they have so many users and it's so solid. Once you try out their app, it's really amazing. So 
that. Um, I'm a huge user of Google Apps, you know, which is also HIPAA compliant. So really kind of figure out what your what technology you're gonna use and and how not to make it overly expensive is, is gonna be really important. Um, the other thing is kind of practical is not to take in too many new intakes at a time. You know, like um, if you if you're very aggressive in your marketing and you know, imagine trying to handle you know, 100 new intakes in a month and still manage your other patients. I mean, it's going to be very difficult. So you, you also have to kind of balance out, you know, how many new patients you can take and then kind of sometimes you have to turn down your marketing efforts a little bit as not to get too many, you know, because if you start to delay the intakes, like I try to make sure that if it's a new referral, I, I see them within a week, you know, and to me, that's good customer service. And if it goes up, I can no longer meet the expectation, then then I'm not providing what I'm promising. And just, you know, it's important to know your practice will organically grow. Um, my patients are actually, they're, they're self-referred. They're people have learned about my service for other people and now they're, they come to me. So I, I did spend some money on marketing earlier, but at the end of the day, it's really people that know that you're there and they come to you. So um, it's important to have a philosophy so our, mine, and actually, well, for therapy works, is low clinician to client ratio, uh, being very client-centered, same-day service. Like, I always make sure that um, if I get a message to a VC, I'm answering it within, you know, hopefully that hour. And I never do not answer emails, you know, that I receive during the day. So I always make sure I get that taken care of. So being highly available, service-driven, and really provide high-quality care, which, of course, means keeping up on learning and, and changes in healthcare. So I'm open to any questions you folks may have. Chris, thank you so much for <laughs> the great presentation. So this, uh, if you say a bit about the immature neurons, <laughs> that, that, that's yeah, really funny. funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I guess for the audience members, uh, we're going to open up to questions and feel free to just type your question in there. And uh, uh, there, I guess, um, so we actually have a question from Frenchin asking, so what are the Google apps that are HIPAA compliant that you have used? Okay, so what you do is you contact um, Google, and now I forget what it's called, but it's the, the provider agreement thing. And so essentially, um, you know, Gmail is actually, there, so as far as I know, all the suites are, but you should also contact Google yourself to make sure. Yeah, but yeah, I use it across the board. Okay, great, okay. <clears throat> okay, one second, let me just pull up this. I guess so, uh, we have a question from Robert. So he has, so how do you start a marketing program uh, from scratch? Yeah, that, that part's difficult. You know what I originally, okay, so like, one of the things I tried to focus on were, were like um, institutions that were looking for psychiatric providers. And, and so for that, actually, my, my very first effort was actually with telemarketing, you know, mm -hmm. but I made sure that it wasn't gimmicky. I made sure that it, the, the purpose was to let people become aware that we exist. And then mm -hmm. over several months, the, the clients started to come. I'm, I am looking into social media marketing, but so far mm -hmm. I've been getting enough referrals. I haven't had to do that yet. Yeah. Got it. I, I guess Chris, my ask is like, for example, I mean, you have a lot of referrals, but you've been, I mean, you're a very successful established uh, physician. So if you were to give, let's say, a psychiatrist who maybe is slightly newer, is there like a rule of thumb you can give, you know, for example, if you have so much years of practice, then maybe then you don't really need to do any marketing or versus if you're new, maybe you have to do, is there like some practical guideline you can share with the audience? Yeah. So it kind of goes back. So as much as I try to educate myself about marketing, you know, it, I, I can never educate myself enough. So mm -hmm. my option was going to be if I was to start with being completely unknown, um, I would go to a, a marketing company that specializes because, you know, they're formally trained and, and we all know how important that is. And also they're experienced in, in healthcare marketing. Mm -hmm. And I, I I can't think of their name of the firm right now. I don't even know what would be appropriate for me to say it, <laughs> but okay. but there's some you can research. Got it. I get them for these uh, marketing firms. Are they doing things like SEO for you? Are they doing like advertising on like Facebook? Like, can you share with like yes. what do they what what does it actually do for you on the marketing? 
okay, so again, I researched all this and and they can do all those things for you. You know, the thing is yeah. though, I mean, sometimes it can be several thousand dollars a month. You know, I remember yeah. uh, this lady, cause you know, they, they, they see us and they think deep pockets. So, <laughs> you know, and I remember the original proposal was like 6,000 a month. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> my practice is not that big yet. So it, it can be as little as a few hundred dollars a month for someone that okay. can do like Facebook and can do your website. And okay. SEO yeah. is, um, it's, it's important, but it's not as important as it used to be. Okay. Got it. Okay. We have a question from June asking, so, um, do, do you also do group therapy sessions in your practice as well, where you only do solo? No, no. So for med support, usually it's supportive psychotherapy, you know, kind of helping a person make sure they're moving on, getting their career going, their self-esteem and everything. Um, I, and I spoke with Sam, Dr. Smith about this, and we decided we'd really just focus on, you know, pharmacotherapy and, and we refer out because in my experience, you know, either a psychiatrist or psychologist should be providing therapy if that's what the, what the patient needs. And then it allows me to focus on the medication therapy management. Got it. <clears throat> so um, we have a question from Molly. Uh, so she's saying, so she's an alternative medicine practitioner specializing a former Indian um, um, a medicine. So she often needs to refer to a psychiatrist or therapist uh, in there. So she's asking, so for example, like uh, how would, uh, so if she has a patient in a particular client like, live in a particular state in there, like, what's the best method for her to find psychiatrists maybe like yourselves that she could refer to? I hate talking about my competition, but <laughs> for ethical reasons, <laughs> I will. <laughs> now there's some, um, there, there's some large practices out there, or actually, if you even call them a practice, Milton, um, they're large organizations and they they offer telepsychiatry, you know, okay. patient or business to consumer type, and they're okay. easy to find, you can Google them. So yeah, that's how you would go okay. about it. I guess my hunch is what Molly said, I do know there's a lot of these are big, you know, these where you could find psychiatry big practice. My hunch is she's probably more looking for more like the independence like you, right? Because then she have a relationship so in the future, like anytime she gets somewhere in California, she could refer to, her. she she knows you that next one somewhere in New York, she could refer, it's more like that type, right? And a really high quality psychiatrist, therapist, she, she could build a relationship on. Yeah, I, I you know, it's, I, patient reviews are so huge now. So I, I think, I think if you just Google whatever that city is and type in, you know, tell a psychiatry. I think okay. you're gonna get the, the big players, but I think also you're gonna you're gonna come across um, solo practitioners as well that okay. that are good at what they do. Got it. Okay. So we have a a, a question from the audience, uh, Bojeko. Um, so is telehealth a more practice insurance cover uh, in all states? And then specifically, uh, is there any companies you would recommend to like to go into a like from buying a malpractice insurance? Um, I think you have to really research that on your own and you know, the policies can change. I use HPSO just because I've always used them and I mean, it, it covers me for it. But again, I mean, this is, this is like one of those questions where I get scared to answer. <laughs> I think it's really important, you know, just to kind of call around and, and see, and or maybe if you have colleagues that are, are practicing telehealth. Okay. I see. Colleague. So we have a question from uh, Susanna. So she's asking, um, so how many appointment types do you have? Do you just have initial and follow up, or do you have more like depending on the types of follow up? And that's a great question because I've done a couple of things that are kind of are a little bit scary. <laughs> so, well, I'll tell you why because you know depending on what's going on with the, with the client with the patient, you know. So basically, what I offer is I offer an initial intake. Um, usually it takes about an hour, also with record review and so forth. And then, and then what I have is um, it's a subscription service. And mm -hmm. so I charge a, a monthly fee that's automatically mm -hmm. paid. So I don't have to chase patients down for, for payment. Mm -hmm. But what I promise is, is if, um, for example, if during med adjustment and you just need to see them briefly, I, I don't charge extra for that. Or if they're not mm -hmm. doing that well, I, I don't charge extra. So, so mm -hmm. I, I call them brief, brief follow-ups. So we do med support follow-up, but if something's going on or med adjustment, someone's having a side effect or whatever, you know, I call this a little urgent 
10 minute sessions and I just kind of build it into my day. So I'll just make sure I have 10 minutes in between patients, you know, okay. so that way I can call up on these cases. Got it. So we have a question from Robert. So he's asking, um, so do you, um, okay, in your models, you have this one monthly fee uh, subscription models. So I guess, uh, so he's asking, do you have, uh, does the patient have the like certain financial commitment? Like for example, they had to sign up with you for six months, 12 months or whatever it were. No, no, because um, I, I don't think, you know, I don't think it's good to kind of, for this industry to kind of do it that way. You know, if, if the therapeutic relationship is not there and they're not comfortable with you, then they should be able to go to a different clinician yes. to receive care. Got it. So Chris, um, I have a question. So in your presentation, you mentioned so you charge roughly it's sort of comparable to maybe expensive gym uh, membership fees. <laughs> but to me, as like, as I might just got reaction that I feel like that's really way undercharging. I mean, your service is yeah, way more valuable than like how, is it okay to ask uh, how did you came up with that pricing or? Some of it is kind of like, and it's not that low. I mean, it's not like 24 okay. business. I mean, it's, it's higher. And actually, um, Milton and I, we actually had lunch one time and, and yeah. I remember the reaction I got from you as well was like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was telling you to charge way a lot more. <laughs> No, yeah, and, and I, I don't think I'm undercharging in the sense that, you know, if we're providing a 20-minute follow-up and, and you're seeing, like, three patients or two to three patients an hour. I mean, so I guess for me, I just never – I never thought healthcare needed to be so expensive, and I don't have staff, you know. I, I don't, I'm not renting an office. So I'd be, overhead is, like, really super low, um, you know, and – but here's the thing. So – so I, I, especially to start my practice off at the beginning is I grandfather people in. So their rates whenever, when I, when I increase, because over time it's naturally going to happen, you know, they are going to go up, but the initial patients that come with me, especially organizations that are using my services, it was like an incentive, but it is going to go up over time. I see. Okay. Got it. I mean, I, I think maybe it's still like my advice to most physicians, you, know, you should, you probably could charge more than you. No, <laughs> you charge yeah. More. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe <I'll be> <laughs> Got it. Okay. <clears throat> because we have a, um, a question from Deborah. So she's asking, how do you handle providing service across uh, state lines? Um, what do you only do in company? Yeah, I, I think legally, I need to talk to my insurance carrier about this. Is and actually, state board. Yeah, it really comes down to the state board in that state with what you can do, what you can't do. Um, but. I think in some cases you can consult, but you definitely can't treat unless you have a license to practice in that state. You know, okay. but again, this is kind of a question for the whatever the medical board or board of pharmacy is, and also insurance carrier, and, and you know, a, maybe a short consultation with an attorney would be really good too. Okay, got it, got it. But I have a personal question for. Um, so you mentioned so you don't have any staff, and so uh, do you feel like if you let's say had a, like a virtual front desk person, virtual system? that could actually make you, you know, take away some of the busy work, then you can even provide better, like spend more time with the patient when you feel like it's not necessary. The reason I ask is you could actually have some of these where, once you do telemedicine, right, you could have like, the virtual front desk people. Those are sort of inexpensive. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I see it kind of as milestones. So um, as I get busier and busier, because um, mm -hmm. my practice is growing, um, we're not completely full yet. So as we start to get more full, okay. then definitely we have to have staff. And then also okay. the competitive side of me eventually wants to add more clinicians on and okay. um, yeah. Got it, okay, that makes sense in there. So we have a question from uh, Avis. Um, so she's saying, so she's a pediatric nurse practitioner who provides a primary care, but she's in the process of integrating mental health for children and adolescents into her practice. Okay. So she's asking if we have any um, words of wisdom on how she shall proceed um as far as, as as far as yeah i mean if she wants to provide you know mental health services for kids and adolescents i mean i think she can definitely network with pediatricians and, and refer because um actually because actually i was in the department of developmental behavioral pediatrics when i was at chla and a lot of doctors become uncomfortable in prescribing psychotropic medications to children and mm -hmm. adolescents because it's off-label and there's a lot of liability mm -hmm. with that. So I, I think if you simply network with pediatricians, you can get many referrals for that, especially mm -hmm. when it goes outside of impulse disorders, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it, okay. 
So I have a um, question for uh, Susanna. So she's asking us, so how long are your appointment slots? Okay, so tw so it's an hour um, for initial intakes and then 20 minutes for, for med follow-ups. And, and um, I've been experimenting with patients kind of, they, they actually, they, they, they pick their, their time slots themselves. So, okay. and so far it's been working out. The only thing is sometimes it gets a little bit weird is, you know, you need to follow up with a patient and they didn't schedule themselves. <laughs> so sometimes mm -hmm. you have to track and say, hey, I really need to see you again. You know, we started you on this, okay. been great, but okay. yeah. Got it. Okay, then. So I have a question from Alex. Um, so he's asking, so did you ever accept commercial insurance uh, before? And if so, like, why did you stop? No, I didn't. Um, I spent 20 years in the regional center system, and then I decided to go off on my own. And at that time, that was our, our payer, you know, so, okay. yeah. Got it. Okay. We get this question from Kristen, maybe it's slightly covered, but I guess I'll ask for her again. It's like, so uh, she's asking if you could speak about sort of reimbursement, how do you bill, how do you collect, how do you establish your fees and relate this to potential patients? I'm assuming you're just essentially just monthly fee. Yeah, so I just kind of based it on what, what I, my, my previous fees were. Um, okay. And that's how I kind of established it. Um, again, I'm going to increase the rates, but to start the practice off initially, I'm, you know, I offered a, a it's not low. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's not like, you know, $250 an hour to see the patient, you know? Got it. Yeah. Got it. So, but as we progress, the rates are going to go up, but to start off the, and actually, you know, maybe I wasn't quite aware of what I was doing, but maybe that was a mechanism to kind of get the practice off and going. Mm -hmm was offering um, organizations these lower rates initially, yeah. Okay, in terms of like the part of her question is like, how do you uh, relate this to potential patient? Do you just like you know, list this on your webpage? Or is there like, uh, because the reason that my home is with why she's asking is often doctors don't like to talk about money. <laughs> it's just like, no, it's like do you just, just, yeah, how do you do it? Like, any tips for other doctors? Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I, I kind of shifted paradigm a little bit in, in the way I, I think about this. So it kind of goes back to customer service a little bit. So mm -hmm. I think more about that. So I, I'm very I'm transparent with, with rates and everything is on the website. Um, and as the rate goes up, we're going to, of course, update it. But yeah, it's on the website so people can make a decision. And again, I think it kind of mm -hmm. comes down to, you know, the convenience and the quality of the service, which I try mm -hmm. to keep high standard with. Okay. Got it. Okay. So, <clears throat> so I have a, a question from Robert again. So he's asking, uh, so how do you handle the HIPAA compliant uh, records release? Yeah, so um, I built, <laughs> I, I think whatever I could do with Google, I've done with Google. <laughs> so okay. like, like I built intake forms and also VC has okay. an amazing platform as well. But yeah, I built forms and that's okay. how I get things out. Got it, okay. <clears throat> So I guess, um, so we we'll have a question, but I think of all the uh, the webinar we have done, you you just get, wow, <laughs> like I've seen a question just like flying oh, in here. Wow. So you definitely stimulate a lot, a lot of interest from all the, the audience <laughs> members. Uh, so I have a question from uh, Susanna asking, so what are your patient notes like, uh, I guess since you don't have insurance requirements, like what do you actually document? Yeah, so when I was at CHLA, I mean, it was rigorous, you know. Yeah, um, yeah so, I, I mean, I document everything as if I had a, I had to report to someone. And plus, you know, all the collaborating psychiatrists who, you know, I would be embarrassed if my notes were not well written. So I, I kind of mm -hmm. use, I kind of use a SOAP format a little bit, but I always, okay. yeah, moving on. <laughs> okay, so it's basically this sort of SOAP format to you, nothing fancy beyond that. No, but I mentioned certain things that are important, you know, making sure they're compliant. I always document um, how functional they are, okay. which is the end point. So. Okay. Got it. So we have a question from uh, Fan Chen asking, so if you uh, see a patient have needs for a social worker, like case manager or occupational therapy, or like maybe even, I guess, or other psychiatry, like how, how do you handle those cases? Do you just, do you have a referral where you're referring to these or allied health professionals or like? Yes, yeah, so um, a lot of my patients are already in 
those types of environments where there's already a network of people. And I have another subset, which are individuals and families that come to me. Um, and so far I've been trying, and I don't know if Milton's gonna be angry with me or not, but um, BetterHelp is something I've been looking at as kind of a collaborating okay. partner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. And then uh, we have a question for Kristen asking, so do you have a initial phone contact with the patient to discuss like payments and charge, or do you just Right. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's actually interesting because I'm super transparent on the website, but I okay. usually get the call or a text message asking. So yeah, I disclose at that point. Okay. Got it. Okay. What about in terms of like these things like the patient agreements, consent and stuff? Do you just have a web like, form take care of that? I do. I do is like everything I can electronically. So okay. um, I, I, re, I, I have all the consents and everything set up using Google Forms. Okay. Got it. Got it. So I guess... Um, and the question for Alex asking, so if you have, let's say, like a patient who's like having a suicidal or refuse to go to the hospital, now do you like call 911 for them? Or like yes, I mean, if, if I had a patient, I haven't had a patient in crisis like that yet. You know, I, of course, manage patients with suicidality, but I haven't been in that sort of crisis yet. And again, the majority of the, of the patients I am seeing right now are in the group home environments and so forth. So the caregiver would, would do that. If it was a patient on their own, yeah, I would definitely call 911 because I know where they live and I can help out that way. Got it, got it. So I have a question. Uh, your presentation you mentioned briefly, so you know that a concierge is slightly, uh, like maybe not, you, you didn't want to call your This is an concierge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So can you maybe just speak a little bit more about that? <laughs> because No, I just had input because on my website, I talk about the concierge practice. I thought, wow, it's a great idea. It sounds nice yeah. and everything. And then I just, I don't know, like the scuttlebutt was that that term's not being used as much. And and, and mm -hmm. some doctors felt offended by it, you know, because you think of concierge like, I don't know, some other sort of service. And so mm -hmm. being polite and everything, I changed the terminology. I have nothing against it myself. I see it. Got it. Yeah, I, I just feel like um, I guess I, I I'm not even not a particular us because I do feel like what you're creating is a very either high quality, cost effective concierge service. It's actually really good for patient being there. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Terrific. In there, I guess for the uh, audience members, if you have any other question, please maybe tie in there. Then maybe as we're wrapping up in this, I just Chris, I wrote to like. Thank you so much for sharing your insight on this one. And back to also for the audience member, if you have any further questions, feel free to you can contact us and Chris for the questions and uh, and Chris can share. I guess maybe uh, then Chris, um, do you have like a like a web page or other thing that you can, you know, if interesting, uh, you know, like as part of our marketing source for you in there, people, how, how could people find you? Yeah. Oh, um, I'm at therapyworks.tv or... Um... Okay. Like we reach there. Um, okay. Is my I guess my contact information's not not on the on the information that went out, right? Or it was. Yeah, the web page is on there. We do include the link in there. So how about then? Uh, we'll direct people to go to your uh, site and they can ask you to get more wisdom from you. And of course, <laughs> if you actually have more some patient, definitely refer to you. Chris. That'd be great. But you know, also the questions were amazing. Some of them challenged me a bit. That's pretty cool. So mm -hmm. I learned made me consider more things too. Okay, terrific. And uh, now we have another question from Robert. So he's asking, um, what are you on-call mechanism? Do you provide that through phone or? I do a lot through the VC app, um, or even though I, I recommend the VC app to patients, they still tend to text me a lot. So okay. texting is great. And also it's cool about texting, you know, and that's one of the things I, I mentioned, I, I kind of went against the grain a little bit, like never give out your cell phone information, you yes. know, always, you said limits with patients, or if you promise unlimited follow-up, they're going to take advantage. So things haven't happened. But anyways, I like texting because you can keep it focused, and then you don't have a patient that's going to get all circumstantial on you, and you you never get to the point of what they want. So texting is my my favorite, either through the VC app or you know whatever the patient you. Yeah. Okay, terrific. So we have another question for Andrew. So he's asking us, uh, do you provide a, a like a code of super bill? We invoice the patient so that so the patient themselves they can sort of try to go get the insurance to cover it. No, but I would provide it yeah. if asked. I 
So there's two different ways I'm reimbursed. So if it's through an organization, they prefer that I send them an invoice. Yeah. Um, if it's the individual, I choose an on, online payment system. But actually, okay. you know what? That means that they would receive a receipt naturally from the, from the company. Yeah. So they do receive something, but it's not by okay. definition super bill. With okay. the Terrific. And there was a couple other questions. I apologize. We're not able to, we're coming down to the end of the hour. We're not able to get to all the questions. I apologize to the audience member, but I will pass this information to Chris and we'll post his uh, responses. That's when we make the recording available when you post on the website. And I guess as we're uh, wrapping up, so we have these sort of maybe sort of three final questions. The first question is, um, I mean, you share a bunch of interesting inside Chris today. So if, if the audience member can only learn one thing from you today, like what do you want them to walk away with? Well, that you can do it. <laughs> when people know you're out there and you're providing a good service, you know, you're making the effort to provide a good service, you will get the referrals organically and people will be willing, you know, to to pay for that service. Got it. Okay. That's actually very nice, encouraging to hopefully our audience member could just dive in and yeah, copy <laughs> Right. And then um, the next question is, um, what is this one thing that you believe about telehealth that the, the rest of the world do not believe uh, yet? Wow. <laughs> um, I, I see it as, you know, becoming more, I think as a future, actually. It's disruptive to the way we, we practice in a way, and that scares a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and in, in medicine in general, we, we even if something that sounds intuitively right, until it's proven scientifically, you don't believe it, right? Mm -hmm. So I just I just think that it's it's gonna progress and it's gonna become much more accessible to people and people are using this platform a lot more because of the convenience and the huge cost savings. Okay, okay, got it. Then the last question is, um, so if you had, let's say, a couple of minutes to talk privately with President Trump about telehealth, <laughs> like what were you? What idea were you planned <laughs> you like him to implement? What do you? I can make a really bad joke and say you'd have more money to work on the wall, but that's terrible. <laughs> I'm really not for that. So, okay. that's kind of funny. but yeah, I just I would just encourage. Um, you know what? I think more research in the area would be great because one of the things you know, larger institutions and everything and adopting. Telehealth is again, is, is it proven to work and is it, okay. it are the economics there? So, you know, um, I think mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. I think um, I think more research in the area to, to convince people to adopt it who happened so far. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Like, that makes a lot of sense. I think having that really that high quality research or backup because I think too much right now telehealth is about like hand waving and not enough. Yeah. Uh, the clinical evidence, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then, um, Chris, thank you so much for your time. I guess, uh, Anne, can you put up our, our finishing advertising? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, basically, uh, again, Chris, thank you so much for your time. I guess for the audience member, we're pretty excited. We're uh, getting ready for our telehealth secrets conference. It's going to be held in October 2nd through the 4th. And we have a bunch of really interesting physicians will be mingling there. I think, in fact, I think it's really interesting to you know, meet Chris in person. I think he will be hanging out there. We're going to have a bunch of really interesting physicians sharing ideas. So this year, our theme is called New Revenue Models and Happy Doctors. <laughs> so that's maybe Chris was leading the charge on that front. Okay, so definitely it's like a uh, really interesting place to sign up. And we got some, some discount, uh, I think, a little more longer for discount registrations. We'll be super happy to see you in the Silicon Valley in October. And thank you so much, uh, Chris, for sharing your insights with us. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> thanks. Okay, right. thanks, Chris. Bye, Bye folks. <laughs>